should tell you that it's recording now. Um, so the webinar is recording and I'm going to turn off my camera and I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, can you um, either tell me by voice or in the chat if you can see the Clover screen that I have up? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So welcome to the Clover webinar. It's going to be about an hour. I left time for questions and I am going to, uh, I'll introduce myself because everyone may not know me. I am April Shaw. I am the Librarian of Government Services at the Department of Libraries and I am also the head of Interlibrary Loan and basically the admin person for um, Clover and the Courier. So today's webinar is to cover the basics of Clover and how to get started and just kind of a refresher on um, how to set things up. So I am sharing my screen, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat and on who is logging in. Uh, Angela, you can't see the screen. Can you see it now? It's, it's going to be mostly blue tinted, but I should say welcome to Clover. Okay, perfect. So let me know if you run into any tech problems and I'll see what I can solve. Um, so I'm going to start right at the beginning with logging in. And the Clover link um, is at the top of the screen, but I will copy and paste it into the chat. So to get started in Clover, you just need to click the please log in link in the upper right corner. And then you need to choose your library from the drop down menu. And you can do that by either scrolling through or you can type your Clover code or you can just start to type your library name. So for us, I just write Department of Libraries. Oh, sorry, I'm letting more people in from the lobby. Um, and then the default login for everyone is your Clover code and the word admin. And for anyone who is not logged in, this username is also what your password is set at for a default. If um, you're new at your library and maybe someone set up the account prior to this, they might have changed the password. So you should try to log in using this username and the exact same thing as the password. And if that doesn't work, you can email me and I will um, reset the password. The other option is you can actually um, create more user accounts if you need to. Um, and I did that for everyone. And I just made my login my name because that was really easy for me to remember. So you just need to log in. You can check the remember me. That's not actually going to remember the password. It will remember your username. Um, the browser usually pops up with a question of do you want to remember this password? And you can click yes and it'll save it in the browser. And you just click submit. And then the way I recommend that if you are currently using the default password that you change it. And the easiest way to do that is click on your account and then your profile. And you can change that password right here. You can also change your email from this spot as well. Anything that's grayed out, you can't change in the profile screen. You would have to actually go to the user accounts to change that information. And I can show you how to do that later. Then you just click save at the bottom 
and a little notice will pop up that says your profile has been saved and you can click OK. OK, so that's logging in and changing your password. If you're just getting started with the Clover or there's been some changes at your library, the next step that I recommend working on is the participant record. And the participant record is what tells the system all of the information about your library. And it's everything from contact information to um, the days that you process interlibrary loans and how long requests should sit with you before being processed. And it's also where you would mark um, holiday dates so that your library does not receive any of the notices. And to get to the participant record, you click on staff dashboard. And it's in the ILL admin menu, which is where most of the things that you'll be doing for Clover are. And it's participant record, so it's in the lender category. And there is a lot of information that's in here and some of it you need and some of it you don't. Um, you'll see right at the top is your library code and your library name. The items that I want people to specifically make sure they update are the days that requests are processed. So for us, I'm actually going to be changing this because we're going to be processing Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So I'm going to uncheck Monday and Wednesday. And then days to respond is tied to the days requests are processed. What happens is that instead of being a calendar day it, or a, a specific number of days in a week, days to respond is how many days you are processing your loans. So I usually ask people to make sure days to respond is, sorry, I'm going to mute everyone real quick. OK, uh, I usually ask people to make sure that days to respond matches the number of days that you're processing and that way a request won't sit at your library any longer than one week because we want it to be able to move on fairly quickly so that it can get through all the lenders and not be sitting at a library that only processes one day a week because say you only process on Tuesdays, so you only have Tuesdays checked off. If your days to respond is set at four, it will sit with you for four Tuesdays before it moves on to the next library. Only if you don't mark it as will supply or will not supply, but generally I ask people to make sure that matches the number of days that you're processing. So I'll change ours to three. The next one is the preferred lender list. For us, we have the courier libraries listed in there. And if you're on the courier, I send out an update to the courier listserv periodically of all of the libraries that are on it. And I give you a list of their Clover codes and you add them in there. And once you add those in there, when you request something, it's going to move everyone on your preferred lender list who owns a copy of that title to the top of the list. So for courier libraries, it means that more of your requests should be supplied by courier libraries. And I'll actually talk about the lender list building process a little more in um, a bit because they just updated it and it should be working so much better now. Um, so you can make any changes to that you want. If you are in an area where you would prefer that your items uh, come from maybe a closer geographic range, you could add in any lenders that you want on this list and it will check to see if they own it and if it's available there before it goes system wide. And the system wide list you can't actually edit. It's every library that is in the Clover system. You can put in blocked lenders and the trick with blocked lenders is that it won't block their requests from going to you because it's not blocked borrowers. What it will do is say you have a library that just never responds to any of your requests and you never want any any you never want to borrow from them again. You can put their code in there and none of your requests will go to them. 
and the primary default lender for most libraries is going to say VSS. That is our out of state lender um, account and Linda Willis Pendo is our wonderful person who processes all of the out of state interlibrary loan requests. And what that does is once the request goes through all of the in-state libraries and is either marked as will not supply or the request expires at those libraries because they didn't respond, it will go to us for out-of-state requesting. The only rules for out-of-state requesting is we will not request anything until it has been out for at least six months because most of the out-of-state libraries that we work with won't actually send them until they've been out for a year. So it's sometimes still tricky finding one that will send it when it's been out for six months. So that is our one rule. Um, if you don't want to take out the primary default lender um, and you don't want it to go to out of state or you want to be able to say, yes, I want this one to go out of state. No, I don't want this one to go out of state. You can, you have two options. There is a field in the request form that says, do you want this to come from out of state? And you can put yes or no. Um, for some reason that does not show up for everyone. Another option is to mark in the borrower's note, please don't request from out of state. We look at that field on every single request, so we won't request it from out of state if you say no, please don't. So that is the basics of this. The other sections that I want to make sure people look at and update, and you can jump to any section of the participant record using the buttons at the top in the middle. So the contact info is next. And I just like to make sure that you've updated any of your mailing information because this is what shows to other libraries as well. And then you need to have a contact person. So I have myself listed as the ILL contact and it has my phone number and my email address. And then we have a technical contact because you can actually list a few different ones. The one that shows up for people is the first interlibrary loan contact. I ask that you at least put in an email address because that makes it easier for people to reach out. And that email address will show up on requests when you send them. So you can add in up to three interlibrary loan contacts. And then the next one is the holiday dates. This lets people know when your library is closed and it also lets the system know that you are closed and not to send requests to you. So for us, ours ends on May 15th. We should, in theory, I'm still working out the details, be able to start our interlibrary loan services again next week. But you can do this, you can put in as many as you want. You could put in an entire year's worth of holidays so that they're already in there and you don't have to think about it. And you can put in any staff vacations. And you can actually check off the box to display to patrons, or you don't have to. Um, but when someone sends a request, they'll actually, in the request details, it will say, skip this lender, try again after this date, and then it will just automatically go to the next lender. And then once you make those changes, oh, actually there is one more section I wanted to show you. So you'll see at the top in the middle, it says patron notices and staff notices. You can set it up so that there are notices sent to the patron automatically or to your staff automatically. So if you click on patron notices, there's a whole range of emails that can be sent. You can say, you could do pending, which means, oh, it's a way of telling them, look, your, your um, request has been sent. It's in process. You can do when it's overdue. So it, and when it hits the due date in Clover, they'll get an automatic email. This is for anyone who put the patron information into the request. So if you are on Vocal and you have, or if you are another library that has SIP2 enabled, it pulls in your patron information automatically. So it would send them any of these 
notices that you have set up. All you have to do is click that and you can add a note to this if you wanted to and then you'd save it. I don't actually send any out to our patrons so I didn't I'm not going to set any up. You can um, put in an email notice set up so you could just say a message mm -hmm. about your interlibrary loan and you can put the library's name and you can put a from address and you can put that as the library's ad email address and that way they could hit reply and it would go back to you in case they had any questions. And if you have someone who wants to receive a copy of any of the emails sent to patrons, you can put a CC address. And then right below that is the staff notification set up. And the staff notifications are split into two sections. There's borrower emails, which is you as a borrower. And then there is lender emails, and that's for requests to lend your materials. And you can put different email addresses in for either of those. And you can check off any of the ones that you want to receive. Let's say you don't want to receive an email when you send a request, but if you get a conditional response, you do. So you can check off that, put your email address in there. Um, let's say you have one that is unfilled and you want to be notified so that you don't have to check every single day to make sure that it's unfilled. You can check off that. And then for your lending emails, you can put your email in and every time your library receives a new request, you can check off new lending request and it will send you the information about this request. And you can do that with any status changes for those as well. And I'm not going to actually set those up right now. So I'm going to uncheck them. And then when you're done making any changes to this, you just click in the upper right corner, submit. And it will say, are you sure you want to make changes? And you say, OK. And you'll see at the top in big red letter, successfully updated participant record. So those are the main parts of the participant record that I wanted to show you. Um, the contact information and the holiday dates are the most important ones for other libraries. So it's, it would be wonderful if you can make sure those are all updated and the days to respond and days requests are processed are what help keep the system operating as efficiently as possible. The preferred lenders is great for courier libraries and the patron notices and staff notices are optional, but I know a lot of libraries like to have the staff notices set up, especially if you get new lending requests and that way you don't have to log in every single day to see if you've gotten new lending requests. So I'm going to close that. And I'm going to get started with um, searching and requesting. So I'm just going to wait until the end to ask for any questions. Um, so searching to request items in Clover, you just need to search for them. And you just use the big search bar in the middle at the top. And you can search with an all heading search. You could do author, title, subject. There's a lot of different options in the drop down menu. And if you want to search specific catalogs, you just need to click the little pancake icon and it will tell you all of the libraries that are actually listed in Clover. And there are a lot. Um, if you want to request from specific libraries, I find the best way is to limit search results to their catalog. Um, and that way, you know, you're requesting from their record. Limiting your searches to a specific library does not guarantee that your request will only go to that library because the search process and the lender list building process are two separate things. And I can show you how to make sure your request only goes to a specific library. But I really want to emphasize that if you limit your searching, that doesn't mean it's going to limit who the request goes to. So I'm going to leave it as all the libraries checked off. 
and you can just start searching and you'll see it automatically completes or it gives suggestions. You can do title, series, author. Let's say I wanted the Harry Potter series. You can just click on that and it's automatically going to search. And you'll see it says up in the um, top right how many search resources remaining. It has 88 more to go through. Now it's down to three. So it's going to keep updating. And you, if you see what you want and it's already popped up, you can click on it. You don't actually have to wait for that to finish. Um, and you'll see it's going to populate as it, as it searches. And you can click Add to Results if you want to add in the rest of them. You can limit by format. All of the limiters are on the left side. So you could do format, author, date. You could also limit um, searches by the libraries from this field. You can do publisher, title. Um, let's say I really wanted a audio book. I will click on audiobook CD. And let's say that what I wanted was Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And I wanted the audiobook. You'll see right now it's just audiobook and that title. And you can click request this item. And it will take you to the request this item form where all of the information for that item is populated. If you do have SIP2 enabled, it's going to look a little different. It's going to ask you to enter the patron's barcode first um, to verify. And for this one, since we don't have SIP2 enabled, you just put in the patron's information. Anything with a red star needs to have something in it. Uh, for contact one, I usually put in an email address. And then all of the SIP2 information should be sent be populated already and then you just click submit. I'm not going to actually submit it because I don't want them to send it. So I will click cancel. Actually I'm going to click submit and I'll show you how to cancel a request as well. So when you click submit it's going to give you a confirmation and it will tell you the request number and it will tell you it's in the awaiting lender. So right now it's building the lender list. So what it's going to do to build the lender list is actually look at the ISBN. So it used to populate the lender list trying to match the title, the format, um, and the I believe it was the publisher and the year. So instead of doing that, now it builds the lender list based on the control numbers, which for books is the ISBN. So right now, to build the lender list, it's looking through all of those catalogs live, finding this ISBN and creating a lender list out of that. And what you can do is you can either just click OK or you can click Print. I will click OK. And it will take you back to the search results. So I'm going to show you how to check on all of your uh, requests right now. You click on Staff Dashboard. And in ILL admin, you'll see request manager. And request manager is basically the place where you control all of the requests that you have, both as a borrower and as a lender. And in request manager, everything on the left side is you as a borrower. And then everything on the right side is you as a lender. So mine is still in awaiting lenders because it's still building the lender list. So I'm going to catch it before it actually goes out. And say you realize suddenly that you asked for the wrong book and you needed the first book, not the third book. You can just change it to cancel and hit submit. And it will cancel that request and it will show up in canceled. So this is the screen where I track all of the, the requests that I have sent. Um, since I don't have notifications, I usually just check it every day. We see what's been unfilled, what's in retry, uh, what's overdue. And if I had any requests currently out, it, there would actually be a pending category here. 
And I tell people not to panic if their requests are impending for a long time. That doesn't actually mean that it's not going anywhere. It means it's going to several libraries. And I will show you with my canceled ones. Let me find one that I actually sent. So we'll say the Night Circus. This one I canceled. Um, you'll see this was the lender list they had built for it. And this one I was just testing out. Um, I was recording some tutorials for this one. So what you can see with any of your requests is the history information. So for this, you'll see that on April 17th, it went into awaiting lenders at 1013 AM. And then 30 seconds later, it was canceled by me. So what you'll see for a lot of these, I don't have any currently out requests because no one's, we haven't been um, getting requests from state employees. So what you would normally see is awaiting lenders and then you would see the next several history steps would be that it went to this library where it was marked as will not supply because it's unavailable or it skipped this library because it's currently checked out and it gives a date to try again or it went to this library but there was no response so it expired and moved to the next library and then this library marked it as will supply and it was updated as shipped and it will track all of the changes to that status change um, so it will have a note when you've marked it as received. It will have a note when you've marked it as returned and so on. So the, the history information is really helpful if you ever have any questions about where a request went or why it was marked as will not supply. Okay, so I said I was going to show you. Let me go back to my search. I said I was going to show you how to make sure your request came from a specific library if you wanted it to. So I'm going to go back to my Harry Potter search and I'm going to actually wait for everything to finish loading. OK, so again, let's say I wanted an audio book. Um, this time it'll be Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, but I don't want it to just build a lender list with everyone who owns it. I want it to come from, you know, the library right down the road. So you can click on the detailed record. And it's going to tell you everyone who has it. And it will tell you if it's on the shelf or if it's not on the shelf. And a nice field to look at is the ILL lender field. If it's blank, it means they don't lend that format or they're closed. They're not going to send it. If it says ILL lender, it is a format that they lend. It's available. They can send it as long as they're open. Let's say I specifically wanted a copy. Um, let's say I wanted a copy from Ilsley. The easiest way to make sure that my request only goes to them is to use the multi copy form because that is the only form uh, besides the blank request form that lets you edit the lender list. And by using this record instead of a blank request form, it's the easiest way to make sure that it goes to them. So you would just click on multi copy, which you can use even if you only want one copy. And you'll see that it's searching all, it's building the lender list right in front of you. So it's going to check for who has it based on the ISBN, where it's available, and if they're, I believe it's going to check if they're open, but it may wait until it's sending it. And you'll see nine out of 115. Currently it has 55 lenders with copies of it. And you can actually watch it build this list right in front of you too, if you scroll down. And let's say that the lender you wanted to borrow from is already there. You can actually stop it from building and it won't add any other lenders. And let's say you can just look for the one that you want to borrow from. 
So we'll just, you can delete all of the other lenders. So you just take everyone out. And this is the lender list. So it has their Clover code, their days to respond, and then actually, whoops, this is their um, control number. So you don't need to change any of that. You just need to put in the patron information and then the number of copies needed. So if you wanted to borrow three copies of this, you would need to make sure there's at least three lenders listed and then you could put three in there and it will create a separate request for each of those. But since I only want one, you just click one and you hit submit. I'm not actually going to hit submit for this one and it's going to give you the same confirmation um, screen with the request number that's been assigned to it and it will tell you that it's been submitted now if you wanted i'll show you how to do if you wanted you know five copies of this you can also just click multi-copy and you can do this with books videos you can do it with audio books and you can just let it build and build and it's going to build the complete lender list. And if you have preferred lenders, when you make those multiple forms, it's going to take your preferred lenders that have copies of this and distribute them across all of those requests. So let's see, it's got 57 lenders. I'm just gonna stop it so that I can show you. And it's not, it's going to randomize this lender list and in the patron information and let's say I wanted five copies it's going to take the complete list of lenders that it just built and it's going to split them across those five requests and I'll show you what that looks like you hit submit going a little slow today. I think it's because I have so many people using the Wi-Fi at my house. And you'll see it says your request and it gives you all five request numbers. So if you want five copies, it will send five individual requests. And you can click OK. And I will go to my staff dashboard and my request manager. and it's already sent them. So I have five in pending, which I am actually going to cancel now. So I'm going to update all of these to request cancel, and you'll see it'll tell you which lender it's currently with. But I'm going to request to cancel so they don't actually send them, and they will show up in canceled. And let me show you with one of them what that looks like. That's not the one I wanted. Oh, sorry. Since they have to, once it goes to a lender and you request to cancel, they have to confirm the cancellation. So it's in pending cancel. So with this one, you'll see it built a lender list and it's put these ones for this request. So if you go to the next request, it's going to have a completely different lender list because it split all of those libraries that matched it across those requests. And it's still going to move the preferred lenders to the top so that if I was on the courier, it would split any of the courier library codes across all five. And I can show you right here where it says, this is where I sent it. It's not available at Stowe, so it skipped them. And then that's where I've requested a cancel. And the one last thing that I wanted to show you was actually how to request our discussion sets at Department of Libraries. And for us, we have our list on our website of what discussion sets we own. And you can just type in discussion set and I'm going to use our newest, which is tricking the tally man. And then just search. And 
this is what our discussion set records look like. This is book six. There's actually five copies in there. It's just the actual record for the set as well. So you just click on that. You can just click the request form. But for our sets, it didn't show on the search results because the title for this is so long. It will always say discussion set. And then it will have the title of the book and then it will tell you how many copies we have in that set. And you can just request this item uh, and it's going to tell me that's owned by our library. Um, and I can just request that item, put in the information and hit submit. Um, if it is you making the request, it won't pop up and say this is owned by you. It will just go right to us. And then we will send that out. And you can do this with any of the sets that we own. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but it's just using discussion set and the book title. And all of our records will always start with discussion set, the book title, and then the number of copies. So those are all of the basic things that I wanted to go over with you today. Um, I'm going to check the chat. There are no questions in the chat. I do have one more link that I'm going to put in the chat box, and it's some Clover video tutorials that I've been working on. And there's only five in there right now, but it covers a lot of what I went through here, but it breaks them into bite-sized pieces. I think the longest one is um, a minute and a half, and it's about requesting multiple copies. And if anyone has any questions, yeah, I would love to have them. Um, I, you will have to unmute yourself. So, um, because I, I muted everyone because there was some background noise. So just let me know if you have any questions. You can type them in the chat. You can unmute and just say them and I would be happy to answer anything. Hi, April. This is Kira calling in from Tunbridge. I am brand new to all of this and have two questions. Yes. Uh, what is a discussion set and is Clover an acronym for something? Um, so a discussion set is multiple copies of the same book so that if you have a book club or a book discussion group going, you can request a whole bunch of sets all at or a whole bunch of copies all at once. And ours range anywhere from four to 20 copies, depending on which book you are looking at. And um, there are a lot of resources. And let me actually let's put in the chat on the it's on our website as well, but it's really easy to find on the VLA website. There's a book group resources page. And I'll put that in the chat as well. And it has a list of multiple copy sets from public libraries and a list of the multiple copy sets from us. And because everyone catalogs a little differently, um, it's sometimes tricky finding them in Clover, but it can be done. And so when I say discussion set, I mean multiple copy sets. And Clover is an acronym and it stands for Collaborative Libraries of Vermont. And Mara Siegel came up with it, and it's a great acronym. And are there Thank any you other? Can. You're welcome. And now, as always, if you think of questions later, everyone can feel free to email me, to call me. Um, I do have a cell phone now so let me actually put my contact information into the chat box let me make sure the phone number is right before i send that okay so i just put in my email address and my new work cell phone number and I am checking my regular landline voicemail regularly as well. So if you have my landline voicemail, I'm still listening to those. 
I'm just not in the office right now. Uh, any other questions? I am I'm recording this. So I'm going to make it available for people to watch later as well. Hey, April, this is Wendy at Gilbert Hart. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question that might be for a different, um, more detailed overview than this one. I'm not sure, but we had done, we have one patron that is able to, we set her up to request from home and then we approve her requests. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, can we, I, I wouldn't know how to begin to maybe do that for more folks. And I was thinking that moving forward, it may become a more valuable resource. Yes. Yeah, so there are some libraries that have patron initiated requests. Um, are you in focal? Yes. Yes. So you can automatically let any patron make requests. You have to provide them with the link to Clover and they would have to log in um, where I typed in my name and password. Their user account would be their barcode and their PIN number. And if you have one patron already set up to do this, then technically any patron could log in with their information and their request would also go to a waiting approval where you would approve them and send them out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I have some questions in the chat. Uh, one says, is the loan history kept indefinitely in the system? It is not. So any requests that are completed stay in the system for one year. Um, and eventually I can still look up requests for people, but the patron information also disappears. So it's not a good way for people to track what they have already requested or read. Um, because of patron privacy, that's just how we set it up initially. And Deidre asked, if you don't have SIP2, can you still use the patron notification emails? You can. You need to put their email in as the patron contact. And even if you don't have SIP2, you can actually upload your patron records. I can ask, um, I can ask Autographics to upload those so that you can pull in their information automatically. Or when you make the request, you can just put in their email address. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Newbie question, what is SIP2? Oh, it's a good question. Um, I'm going to admit I do not actually know what SIP2 stands for. Um, I think the IP part is Internet Protocol, but I would not swear to it. SIP2 is a connection between Clover and your um, ILS. So for Vocal, it's a connection between Clover and Koha. And what it does is actually pull your patron information into Clover directly. So it will populate their address, their contact information, and their name. So you don't have to manually type in all of that patron information every time you do a request. And I believe it works both ways in which it will also have the um, item show up as checked out on their account in Koha, but I do not have it enabled because we don't have SIP2 on ours. But it's a very handy trick um, and it's wonderful if you want to do patron initiated requests because it means that they can log in with their barcode and their PIN number and they're verified as um, in good standing and they can search and request items and it will go to awaiting approval so that you can look at their request and just double check that it's not something your library already owns or it's a format that your library will lend and thus can borrow. So it, it's a good step towards patron initiated requests.
You're welcome. Um, any other questions? Hi, April. Th this is Caroline from the Rutland Free Library. Hi. Hi. Um, question about um, the courier and um, in this age of coronavirus, um, how, what sort of um, protocol or safety measures we're taking for um, sending clean items and the packaging itself? Um, being clean or should should things be quarantined when they first arrive? Right. So what I've been advising people to do is treat the incoming courier items the same way that you are any incoming returns. Um, some places are quarantining, some are not. I'm not overly worried about the fabric bags because my understanding is that as soon as if there are any virus droplets on fabric they die off as soon as the fabric dries so the with travel time items in the courier have already had a quarantine period i can't really give guidelines for this because so much is unknown. I did send out a list of um, things that people should consider when creating guidelines and the big thing is consistency. Um, if you are requiring people unpacking to wear gloves, they should wear gloves for the courier, they should wear gloves for incoming returns through the mail, um, if you are doing a quarantine period for items that are returned, make sure that you just stick with that consistency for things returned through the mail, in the return bin, and in the courier bin. I do know that the courier, everyone doing the sorting and the delivering are wearing masks and gloves. So it's we're trying to make it as safe and consistent as possible. Does that help? Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. And if you're on the courier listserv, I did send out a list of things to consider when making your um, procedures for handling courier items. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? All right, um, so there's no more questions in the chat and I don't think if no one has any other questions. I will stop the recording and we'll end. When will the courier start? Um, so the courier for some libraries is starting next week. I have been sending out email updates on the courier listserv and to all of the contact emails that I have for the courier. So if you haven't been getting any of those updates, please let me know, uh, send me an email and we'll figure out why you haven't been getting the updates. But some libraries are starting next week and others aren't sure when they're going to start. So I've got an ongoing list and I'm working closely with the vendor to get everything going at a pace that works for the libraries. But if you have any questions about your specific library, just send me an email. You're welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. Be well. You too.